Becoming a parent, although exciting, comes with all sorts of challenges. You're no longer living for yourself, but now you have another human being that's totally dependent on you. Now imagine dealing with everyday challenges and then suddenly you get bad news that changes your whole world. How do you cope? Should you share the news with your young children and if so, how? That's exactly the dilemma that my real life story guest Donya Yusuf had to face. She's just fought a successful but life-changing battle against cancer and now published her children's book called The Monster in Mummy, which is to help mothers and families effectively communicate a cancer diagnosis to their young children. So before I tell you about my other guest today, I would love to hear about your experiences with sharing difficult news with your children. Did you decide not to tell them or did you think it was best to be open with them? And if so, what was the outcome? Let us know by emailing info at chrissybshow.tv or post on our social media at Chrissy B Show on Twitter and Instagram or The Chrissy B Show on Facebook. So who else is joining me on the show today? Family coach Sharon Lawton will be giving some tips on how to share difficult news with children without causing trauma. Hannah Richards is here to talk about nutrition that helps children feel happier. Dr. Rob Hicks answers your medical questions in this week's Doctor's Answers. And Helena Shah brings you the news around today's main topic. And finally, child abuse prevention expert Marilyn Hawes is here to talk about yet another subject that few dare to address, over-sexualized behaviors in children. What does it mean? Why does it happen? Where does it come from? And how do you deal with it? Well, let's start our show today with our real life story, Donya Youssef. Welcome to the show, Donya. Thank you. So lovely to have you on. So we are going to be speaking about something that affects many, many people. But can you tell us, um, how was life before you were actually diagnosed with cancer? Um, so it's quite an active, busy lady. I run a children's modelling and acting agency and I have two very young children. So I was, um, yeah, always on the go, quite a busy lady. Um, mm -hmm. You know, was quite into my health and diet mm -hmm. and... Yeah. You know, I guess never in a million years did I expect to... I didn't even cross my mind about breast cancer, if mm -hmm. I'm honest with you. Um, I was actually still breastfeeding my little one at the oh, time. Wow. She wasn't quite... Well, she was about 18 months at the time. Yeah, yeah. So um, life was... I mean, it was OK. I mean, two little children and running a business, it can be pretty full on sometimes. Yeah. So I put my tiredness um, down to, you know, working and the children. Mm. Um, I never, I didn't really drink, so I wasn't socialising as such because yeah. I was just tired. And the little one kept waking up in the night, so I just put my tiredness down. But when she started sleeping um, through the night... And you were um, still tired. I was yeah. more tired, and I was oh, thinking, wow. this is not quite normal. So, And that was the only symptom that you noticed I started time. feeling a bit low, mm. and I thought, have I got postnatal depression? Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, there was no reason for me to feel low. And I thought, well, I can't really get postnatal depression this many sort of months after. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought, let me just go to the doctors and just see if there's something mm. wrong. Um, and they did some blood tests. Blood tests came back and said, you know, everything's absolutely fine. So I was like, mm. okay, fine. A month went by and um, I was still tired, but I started exercising more because I yeah, thought, yeah. well, maybe you've just, hit a bit of a low patch and I'll try and spring out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the month went past. Um, I didn't notice any symptoms. I didn't feel ill or anything. Mm. And then um, I went out for my birthday, actually, for the first time. And um, I'd had, you know, a few drinks. Um, but I was really violently sick. OK. And I thought, well, this is... And I thought I'd put it down because I hadn't had a drink in a while. So, again, I just didn't... So you were finding answers for all the... All yeah, the but all these okay. dots. And then when I was breastfeeding my child going back, um, she grew breasts. And this is really bizarre. But she was like a tiny baby. And I kept going to the doctors and I said, there's something not oh quite gosh. wrong with my child. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
there's some like hormone she's getting too much hormones or something not quite right i've so, never heard that before wow no. No, never. I mean, the child, I was taking pictures. I was going to the doctors. They said, oh, it's quite normal. It's, it's from the placenta. So then again, I thought, OK, my hormones have gone from the placenta. They said it'll go. But it didn't go. Mm -hmm. So I, once I stopped breastfeeding, I just woke up one day. I said, I can't do this anymore. So I stopped mm -hmm. and she, was, she wouldn't take the bottle. Um, but when I did stop, um, yeah, I went out that evening um, and they had her little breast mm. decreased um so i knew and i something knew it was something to do okay. with me so then eventually you went back to the to the doctor went back to the doctor when um, did you actually get diagnosed then with with because i found a lump a month later oh, okay under my armpit mm. and my father who's a doctor he said have you felt your breasts and i was like well no i've just literally finished um, breastfeeding abruptly the child because something mm, in yeah, me was saying yeah. something's not right yeah, in here yeah. and um, then they did the, uh, the the doctor felt the breast and said yeah we can feel two very large lumps oh, yeah. but I couldn't feel any lumps it wasn't like a normal lump you'd f yeah. you'd expect yeah. to feel the one under the armpit felt like a normal lump the ones in the breast were really hard and it was like felt like part of my bone when 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 you actually found out when the doctor did say that you have cancer what went yeah. through your mind i thought that was it yeah really? yeah i thought that was it because i was um you know the biopsy and everything were just quite traumatic mm. and um yeah i couldn't speak i was just i couldn't get the words out and they kept saying i'm sorry i'm sorry it's a lot to take in and I just remember the only thing I said was, please tell me, am I going to be all right? Yeah. And my mum was with me. Obviously, my mum, um, she lost my sister, so okay. her first child. So all I kept thinking is, she can't lose any more of us. Mm, so yeah. the first thing was, oh, my God, I'm going to die. So I said, please tell me I'm going to be all right. They said, whatever we will do, we will get you through this. Okay. So I was like, okay, okay, well, can you tell me, you know, what stage we're at, where we're at. And they said, oh, you're grade two. And I was like, oh, great, because I was thought I was grade three or four. Yeah. And so I said, oh, thanks very much. Um, if you could just let me all the, know the other details um, at another point. And I just got my bags and I wanted to digest the information myself. I think it was like a flight yeah, or yeah, fright type yeah, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, you need to sit down. So I was like, OK, well, what, what now? They said, it's travelled to the lymph nodes. Oh. It's come out the breast tissue. So I was like... Well, what does that mean? They go, it's a possibility it's gone to the body. I was like, oh, my God. Um, OK. And they said, right, we're going to have to start you on chemo. The tumor Did, was, was it the thoughts of, about your kids already running through your mind at this yeah, point? my partner yeah. was in tears. Yeah. Um, what you would tell the kids and everything. Yeah, all my brain was thinking, how am I going to tell these kids? What am I going to... Um, what am I going to do if I die? Mm -hmm. You know, I kept, I went all really practical. I just couldn't, sorry, I couldn't actually figure out what um, I was going to say. I didn't know mm. what to say, um, okay. but I was just crying and crying. I just felt like I'm dealing with death now. Okay. Now, Don, you did feel that it was important to tell your children what was going on. How, how did you go about that? Um, yeah, I got a book from online, which was called Mummy's Lump. Mm. And I just wanted, I wanted them to know. I didn't want them to hide anything for them, but I didn't know how to tell them. Mm -hmm. So throughout my treatment, I diarised every single emotion in me and I wrote it down. And I just, because I was up late researching every night, I needed to find answers on what to tell these kids. Yeah. I needed yeah. to be honest with them. I told them there's a lump in mummy's um mummy's boopy mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be there and the doctors were going to do everything they could okay. to take it away um but they couldn't really understand i mean they went through all emotions themselves it really yeah. affected them yeah and that's when i decided i have to do something to help these kids and other mothers out there so that's amazing that actually with all that you were going through it's amazing that you actually thought to do something like that in yeah. the first place how you mustered up that strength to do it yeah i just i kind of felt a little like, invisible i didn't i just i just didn't want to think about it for me so mm. when i talked about it, it was like i'm talking about someone completely different okay. yeah. um and then my children you know i just every time i looked at them sometimes I just broke down i just it mm. was not 
nice feeling. Mm-hmm. And all I kept thinking, they're so young, why is this happening? Yeah. Um, but there we go. Um, I decided I needed to turn around lots of, you know, I was in hospital all the time. Um, the chemo really affected me. Mm-hmm. Um, I picked up sepsis, blood clots, um, infections every week I was in the hospital. Um, so the kids needed to know, they didn't have a clue what was going on. Mummy's hairs all fell out, mm-hmm. had l- really long hair before. So they couldn't really digest what was going on. So once I diarised everything, I decided then, I'm going to put it in a book. So I reached out online. I said, can anyone help me? I need to find a publisher. I need someone to help me. I need to get a book out. I need to help my kids. And I need to help all these mothers on these groups with their kids because so many people are struggling. And I kind of got this weird kind of supernatural powers or energy, as you should say. And I just went for it. And I thought, right, I've got to write this book. And I've got to help everyone else. What's your book called? The Monster and Mummy. Monster and Mummy, wow. So it's kind of a therapeutic thing for me. Yeah. But then it's obviously it was helping other people at the same time as well. Okay. Um, we also got Joanna Lumley. Um, she wrote a lovely piece for the back of the book as well. Oh, brilliant. Um, and also, like, all these kind of stars and producers came forward and they wanted to, well, turning the book into a feature film currently. Brilliant. So lots of amazing things have really happened from something which wasn't great. Um, Donya, just can you just tell us, just describe the book a little bit as well. What what is it? Is it like this, your own story? Is it if is it based on other things? How how is it work? Based on my personal experience, mm-hmm. um, but obviously I wanted to highlight to everyone else what actually does go on. Okay. Um, in child friendly language, yeah, so yeah, they know course. exactly. Yeah. Because they asked me all these questions. What did your kids think when they read it? Oh, they loved it. I mean, they still read it now. Like, um, every night. The little one loves it. I mean, she's two. But she just looks at the pictures and, Mummy's not well here. But Mummy's better now. You know, so she goes through it all and she understands in her language. Yeah, yeah. Which is so important, isn't it? So important. How was that for you, though, seeing your your children's reaction to the book? Oh, it was was amazing. You know what? It was like the best feeling ever because their little faces in, were in the book you know they are in the book yeah. and they just yeah it was like I felt like it was a, a healing for us all yeah and um we kind of got through the other end yeah. that's what I'm saying because you know something something that seems well it is obviously getting a cancer diagnosis is something very negative and very traumatic yeah. to have to go through and then obviously all the treatment and stuff yeah. but you've managed to turn something that was so difficult for all of you for the whole yeah. family yeah. into something so positive and yeah. that's helping lots of other people yeah. now even films coming out as well yeah we've got um yeah two feature films so we've got a, a big animation and a yeah. full cast feature film in developing it's stages amazing. at the moment. So How does that feel? It's like, <laughs> it just feels really surreal. It's like <laughs> little Donya yeah. and all these like amazing things are happening, yeah. which never in a million years I expected. So I feel actually the happiest I've ever felt since all this negative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's all, I strongly believe in mindset, uh-huh. keeping yourself positive and keeping yourself yeah. busy, distracting yeah. yourself away from cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just going to bring you down. Can I, can I ask as well, how's your health now? How's it going with everything? I've got all the clear. Oh, amazing. So, yeah, so I do strongly believe all these wonderful positive things have, have got me through. Brilliant. So, yeah, amazing. just was in hospital this morning, actually, and yeah. positive results. Oh, so I'm so happy for you. Really pleased. So. So, Donna, I'd like you to keep in touch with us, let us know how the films are going, yeah, and obviously course. we'll have you back on and give us the update. Of course, yeah? yes, definitely. So lovely speaking. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone, don't go away because after the break, we have on family coach Sharon Lawton, who'll be giving some tips on how to share difficult news with children without causing trauma. And also Hannah Richards is here to talk about nutrition that helps children feel happier. The dance helps you express yourself and your feelings and that you can... um tell someone about how you feel except from being scared. Absolutely brilliant. Um, Dancing just makes everybody joyful um, and that's one of the things that we encourage a lot of in this school is lots of dancing and singing um, and they've just had a brilliant time and that's the best way to get a, a good message across.
Welcome back to today's program, everyone, which we have titled, How Can I Tell My Child That? So now to help us is our resident family coach, Sharon Lawton. Welcome back to the show, Sharon. Hi, Chris. Love to have you on. So obviously it is very difficult when you do have young children and when you you go through things as adults, maybe there's sickness in the family, as we've heard already, or other issues that come up. So how, how do you actually deal with telling your children difficult news? I think trying to tell anybody any type of difficult news is hard. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to tell a child, it, it seems to be even more difficult for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we sometimes really underestimate what children are able to deal with. So, you know, what I would say really is, you know, just have a, a real think about, you know your child best, you know, all your viewers there will know their child best. Really have a think about, um, you know, you can plan in advance, have a think about, right, okay, so what is it that I want to tell them? I would also say don't over-prepare, because mm. if you over-prepare and try to make the conversation perfect, before you actually have that conversation, then of course your child might then ask a question that you haven't thought about and then that's yeah, completely yeah, yeah. thrown you. Yeah. Um, but there's no, re there's no right or wrong way of having these conversations really. You've got to do what you feel is right for you. But how much should you maybe tell your child? Because obviously there's some things that maybe it's not good to tell them everything. Mm -hmm. And also what age do you think it's good to tell Yeah, I, I, I think the thing to remember is that we, and rightly so, we want to protect our children. Mm but we can't stop them from being sad. And I think children mm. actually know if we're trying to hide things from them um, and we're worried about something ourselves, they know. And so therefore by pretending that nothing's happened or you know, sort of like hiding it from our children, they get to just get a bit of a feeling that something's not quite right. And that can be even more disconcerting okay. for them yeah, yeah, than yeah. actually the news in the first place. Obviously age appropriate, using nice, clear language. So for example, um, you might turn around and say, oh, you know, we've lost mummy or we're going to lose mummy. Now for a child mm. that has special needs or a very young children, that can be really confusing. They might think, well, why don't we just go and find her then? Mm. So yeah. we need to be really aware of the type of language that, that yeah. we're using. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, and again, you know, just honest, age appropriate, and really just to give them that confidence and resilience to know that they can come and ask you questions whenever that they feel that they need to. We don't have to have all of the answers right there and then. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of parents are trying to um, avoid causing trauma to their children mm. as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, of course, and, and when it's a difficult question, I think sometimes we can overthink it. Um, you know, choose your timing. Mm. So if it's during the school term, you might think, okay, well, let's, let's do it right at the beginning of the weekend. That way you can have that conversation and the children will have an opportunity to be able to digest it over the, okay. the weekend, mm. reflect, come back, ask any questions that they might need to. Um, you know, choose a time when it's quiet, where you're not going to be interrupted, where there's not going to be distractions. So turn off phones and mm, you know, turn yeah, off the television. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, if if both parents are around, well then tell the children together. If you're a single parent, you might decide you want to do it alone, mm. or equally you might choose to share the news with um, an adult that the children know well and also trust, okay. or even a health professional that you know that you trust. There are no right or wrong ways to do it, but I think it is important to be honest, as honest as you can be. You don't have to know all the answers. You know, you can. There are some yeah. fantastic charities. Winston's Wish, for example, um, and Hope Again, they have some fantastic information and support for young people okay. going through trauma yeah, and, yeah. you know, um, experiencing bereavement or just sort of a terminal illness or, you know, or difficult news of any kind, really. Okay. Yeah. Um, and things like, you know, I've mentioned before, you know, sort of worry boxes and thoughts and feelings books where you can sort of write down your feelings and, you know, sort of share them that way mm -hmm. rather than feeling able to, to sort of um, share out loud. But, you know, take your child's lead. You know, yeah. Sometimes we can be shocked. We tell them something and they go, oh, right, can I go and play on my bike now? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, you just never know. You do never, you? never yeah. know. And each situation is different and each child is different. Okay, brilliant. Sharon, thank you so much. You're so welcome. And we'll see you again very soon. Look forward Hopefully. to it, Chris. Brilliant. Well, everyone, now it's time to talk to our nutritionist, Hannah Richards, who's going to be talking about foods that can make children feel happier.
Welcome to the show, Hannah. Hi, Chrissy. So today we're going to be talking, or you're going to be talking mm -hmm. all about how, what foods we can give to children that can make them feel happy, especially if they've been going through a hard time. Sure. Um, I think the main thing is with kids is getting them to enjoy food. And I think sometimes mm. parents really struggle with giving them a variation, yeah. um, different foods, rotating foods and meals, because often parents have come home, they're very tired, they work mm. really hard, and they just want to put food on the table that their kids are going to enjoy. And sometimes that can be a bit lacking in variation. So okay. the major things, are for, I would say, are getting in the fruits and the vegetables for, for children, because okay. they give us, that's where all our nutrients, and our vitamins and our minerals come from. From. So brightly coloured foods, berries are really good. I think it's really important that if they have their fruits in their like dessert as it were, then they mm -hmm. can have their ice cream or their yoghurt or their biscuit or their yeah. sort of treat by the side. But as long as they're getting those fruits in, then they're getting almost like a multivitamin. Okay. I think the other yeah. thing that's really hard that parents struggle and parents that I see as well is how to integrate vegetables into their diets. Mm. And I know a big favourite for kids is pesto pasta. Um, oh. Well, not even for adults yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. It's such a good flavour, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. And so, what I would just say is, can you get another green veg? Can you get a green vegetable in there? Mm. Could you? Can you? hide some spinach in amongst the pasta can you yeah. put a bit of broccoli in can you you know it's about just trying new things with kids mm -hmm. um, whereas if you just have a bowl of pasta again its nutrient value is quite low mm. so if you can get the vegetables in then the nutrient value becomes higher and they become happier and healthier and stronger mm -hmm. So it's all a bit, you know, it's all about repetition and people learn and children from repetition and it yeah. always being there. And then they develop a taste for it mm -hmm. um, and they become easier to feed <laughs> almost <laughs> I can imagine. or Especially more compliant. Maybe if they, they take part as well in the cooking maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. The more you involve your kids, you know, I see lots of parents who struggle with finding foods for their children. And I say it's, you've just got to get them interested from an early age. Mm. It's very easy. And I totally understand how hard it is having children and having to be the cook and the full-time mum and the full-time yeah. dad. Yeah. But there's just got to be a little bit more extra thought around feeding children mm -hmm. so that it becomes easier because if it's just frozen food or the same meal every time, then you're going to struggle um, yeah, yeah. to a greater degree. So absolutely, getting them involved in the kitchen. What do you want to eat? Mm -hmm. We'll do this if we can do that. So it's okay. a bit of give and take. Yeah. And um, obviously there's also some, some nice little desserts, healthy desserts mm -hmm. that you've also made on, on yeah. the programme before and like at your house as well that yeah. are really good for kids, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, you can just take your favourite dessert and see how you can make it healthier. Mm -hmm. So you could make your own ice cream we should do that on the show once oh, yeah. it's not that too, that <laughs> tough but you know rather than buying a muller yogurt for example or a yogurt that's already mixed together can you buy you know a greek yogurt and then put your fruit in it mm. so you, you you get the same thing but it's much healthier yeah. and it's much higher in nutrients as well okay um peanut butter and chocolate's a great one that go together oh. Um, nice. we have, I think there's a recipe on the website for mm -hmm. peanut butter cups that yeah. you melt chocolate on top of. I mean, everything, anything you make yourself is 100% healthier. Yeah. So you can't go wrong if you're making it yourself in the kitchen. In terms of also giving, not just making them feel happy, but giving children more energy. Mm -hmm. That's assuming you want to give your children more energy. Maybe when they're going off to school, and there may be something else to calm them down yeah. a bit. What about energy before they, they go to school, would you say? Energy before they go to school. Yeah. I would say essentially before every kid goes to school, they need to have a glass of water, not mm. a glass of Coca-Cola or something oh, yeah. funny coloured. Yeah. A glass of water, because it's like if we if we water those flowers, they grow. Mm -hmm. And if we water ourselves, we grow. And our cells come alive and we're yeah. ready to learn. So definitely water and then something to eat. You know, whether that's a banana or a piece of fruit, a handful of nuts, a bag mm. of nuts, um, toast and peanut butter, toast, yeah. peanut butter and banana. You know, the nice. list goes on. Yeah. But making sure they've got something almost f fresh and from the earth. So mm. fruit or a vegetable or, um, you know, a bowl of cereal for sure, but just put some fruit on it. Yeah. Brilliant. Hannah, thank you so much. Pleasure. And we shall see you again next time. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, everybody, don't go away because after the break, we have one Helena Shard bringing you the news around today's main topic. And Dr. Rob Hicks answers your medical questions in this week's Doctor's Answers segment. And here's one of the questions we received. What causes hiccups? Find out the answer after the break. Hi, I'm 
Chrissy B, host of the UK's only TV programme dedicated to mental health and well-being, The Chrissy B Show, which airs on MyTV Sky 191 every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Follow our social media on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter at Chrissy B Show and our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. For more information, visit chrissybshow.tv. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, the UK's only program dedicated to your mental health and well-being. So now it's time to look after your health with Dr. Rob Hicks in this week's Doctor's Answers. Hi, Rob. Hi, Chris. It's another lovely cup of tea this it week. It is really nice. It looks really good. Yeah. I've just got water today. The healthy option. Yes. No, I just, I just can't sleep if I have it this okay. time. No, all. with the caffeine. No, <laughs> yes. So we have a few questions for you today, Rob. Thank you. And by the way, everybody, if you have a question for Dr. Rob Hicks here, all you need to do is email us on doctor at chrissybshow.tv. So first question. Is there any cure for cold hands and feet? I'm tired of saying cold hands, warm heart. I'd like both my heart and hands to be warm, please. A nice this request. person sounds a bit annoyed at yes. first. <laughs> I, th I think probably they're fed up of people saying, oh, your yeah, hands are yeah, cold, aren't they? Yeah. Um, well, uh, the reality is, is if that's the only symptoms you've got, it's likely to be normal for you. And the, mm. so the steps that you can take is actually to make sure that you wear gloves uh, or, you know, thicker socks or thicker tights, you know, something that will keep the hands and feet warm, you know, because you can't do it any other way, really. Um, a question I would have for you is, is whether this is a relatively new thing or whether you've got other symptoms. So do you get any sort of numbness or tingling or pain in the hands and feet? Because if that's the case, you ought to have it checked out with the doctor. There is a condition called Raynaud's syndrome where people in response to cold and indeed to stress find that they develop cold and painful um, uh, fingers and toes. Sometimes the end of their nose and the ears get, get, the, get the same as well and it changes colour. Um, but the reality is, is, is lots of people have this sort of, sort of uh, problem. If you're taking um, medication, have a look at the, the list of side effects to make sure that can't interfere with circulation and be likely to cause cold you know, hands and cold feet. But lifestyle things are what you need really, I think, you know, so make sure that you keep the, keep in, in a warm environment that you, as I said, mentioned, you know, gloves and, and, and socks and stuff. Um, don't smoke, take regular exercise and uh, keep stress to a minimum. And then just celebrate the fact that you've got a warm heart. Yes, it's true, yeah. very true. Next question, Rob. This viewer is saying, I hate smear tests, so why do I need them if I'm not sexually active? Well, that's a very, very good question. And the, and mm -hmm. the, the, the question I have, is is this person has they have they never been sexually active oh, right. or are they currently different. not mm. sexually active yeah. for somebody who's never been sexually active then the risk of cervical cancer is incredibly low it's not zero but it is very 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 low and i would suggest if, if you fall into this category that you've never been sexually active um, have a chat with your practice nurse or with your, your own doctor to see whether it is necessary for you or not, because you might decide actually it's not necessary. If you are saying that although you're not sexually active at the moment, you have been at some point in your life, even if you've only been sexually active on one occasion, you know, with, with, you know, uh, and that may not have been a penetration, that may just be genital, genital you know, contact, um, with a man or a woman, then yes, you should have regular smear tests. Uh, the reason being is that the vast majority of cervical cancers are caused by a virus, the human papilloma virus, um, and this is a sexually transmitted virus. So yes, you should have regular smear tests if you've ever been sexually active. Now, you mentioned that you don't like it, and I've not met a woman in my practicing <laughs> career who likes to have a smear test, so you're in the majority there. So mention to the practice nurse or the doctor, whoever's going to do the, the smear test, that you feel anxious so that they can take steps to help relax you and make it a more bearable experience for you. And then think about relaxation techniques like meditation, for example, deep breathing, or distraction techniques like using your mobile phone to, to, to do a game or something. I like to do that during the Yeah, of course, really? because actually, oh. you know, you, you, you don't, the, the woman doesn't necessarily have to do anything. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. This is a test that's done by the healthcare professional. Yeah, so okay. do something that actually distracts you from the fact that it's going on. Oh. And there's a better chance then, that you see, if you're relaxed, that it won't feel so uncomfortable. Mm. And there's also a better chance that if you're focused on a book or your mobile phone,
phone that the test might even be done and you won't even realize it's been done because the, oh, wow. the, the, the person's that good at doing it and that yeah, quick yeah. Yeah. that you, you and I've had lots of pe women say that say well have you done it yet and it's because they've been relaxed and yeah, somebody's yeah. been talking with them for example to distract them while the test is being done okay wonderful next question Rob what causes hiccups I felt so sorry for my friend the other day when she started to hiccup quite suddenly. Yeah, awkward for the person with the hiccups and yeah. often embarrassing, you know, uh, and, and the people with them who feel, you know, they just feel sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> what is causing the hip hiccups is that we've got a big muscle that helps us breathe called the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And you get these um, involuntary contractions of the diaphragm and that causes the space between the vocal cords in our, in our neck to snap closed. And that's what makes the hiccup sound. Okay. Now, for the vast majority of cases, we've no idea why it happens. Um, it can um, occur as a result of stress. It can occur as a result of intense emotions like excitement, or it can happen because of eating and drinking. Um, but for the vast majority of people, it's a, it's a short term thing um, and, and it, it just stops spontaneously. Um, sometimes it goes on much longer. So if you are some, you know, if it's going on for more than 48 hours, oh, you, wow. you, which is, you know, which it can do and it can go on for <sighs> weeks and months for some people. Um, Goodness. That does need a checkup uh, because sometimes there are medical conditions or it's because of a medication that's being taken that's causing the hiccups. So things you can do to try and advise your friend if she should get hiccups again uh, to stop them, um, well, take some deep breaths, uh, drink something very, very cold, uh, pull, pull the knees up to the chest, leaning forwards, um, hold your breath for a short period of time, uh, try some granulated sugar, uh, try some vinegar, try some lemon, all these things um, can help and when I was growing up it was always trying to drink water backwards out of out of a cup but mm. what that tended to do was the water went just everywhere yeah but ironically the hiccups then stopped the sort of things to avoid um, don't eat food or drink drink liquids really quickly as some people suggest doing mm. don't chew chewing gum because in the with the hiccup you might inhale the piece of chewing gum um, stay away from fizzy drinks and hot drinks and spicy foods as, as well and those are the sorts of techniques um, that will make things worse and that obviously the other techniques that I mentioned are things that can stop the hiccups from occurring when they when they start. There were two things my gran used to do when we were children. She used to try the shock treatment. Mm. One was like just dropping an ice cube or a cold key yes. down our back. Yes. And the other one was just slapping us out of the yes. blue so when we weren't expecting it. Yes. I can't remember if it worked or not but yeah there's like everyone has their own little everybody has their own ways <laughs> and some of them absolutely work yeah. and some don't so that's why there's such a, a variety yeah. just just try a different ones okay but don't slap your children too no hard, no no <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to frighten them <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> okay last uh, question for today rob i have showers all the time rather than baths because i get thrush easily especially if i sit in soapy water but i'd love to have a bath now and again is there anything i can use apart from femi gel there's a few key points in this question. Mm. Um, the answer is, yes, you can have a bath. Um, keep soap out of the bath. That's, and oh, and, and gels. Yes, yeah, so you're sitting in it. And the, the soaps um, can cause the irritation that may make thrush more likely. Um, so yes, you can have a bath. Make sure the water isn't too hot and make sure you don't sit in the bath for too long. Um, the other thing to think about is that m many people think they've got thrush and, and um, when actually what they're getting is uh, a, another infection called bacterial vaginosis. So if you've not had the thrush actually diagnosed by a doctor, um, next time you get symptoms, I, I would do that to make sure it is thrush so that at least you know what you're treating. What are the things that you can do? Well, you know, make sure that uh, cotton clothing, loose clothing is, is again, helps pr to prevent thrush. Um, Make sure that you use plain water uh, and an emollient to wash with. Make sure you dry properly. So don't rub the gentle area dry. Just pat it dry very gently and make sure it's thoroughly dry. And things to avoid in the water are things like perfumed soaps. Uh, don't douche, don't use vaginal deodorants um, and don't wear tight, irritating clothing, um, particularly synthetic clothing and tights. But do get yourself checked out if you're getting recurrent episodes of this because sometimes recurrent thrush is actually because of undiagnosed diabetes and you want that treated. Okay, brilliant, Rob. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We'll see you again next week. Yeah. All right, everybody, so now it's time to go to the news with Helen Ashard.
Welcome to the show, Helena. Hello, Chrissy. Are you so, good? Yeah, very good, thank you. It's good. good to see you. So good. starting off with Rachel Bland, um, inspirational newsreader, broadcaster, or was. Mm. Um, she, she unfortunately battled cancer for two years. And she was so loved by everybody, so well known, but she's done so much good as well. Um, I mean, she's obviously loved by her husband and her beautiful three-year-old, Freddie. Mm. Um, she shared her blog, Big C Little Me, talking about cancer, really destigmatizing, doing so much, you know, people were talking to her and yeah, she was helping yeah. people through it. Um, it's amazing also, that you do that when you're not well yourself, yeah, isn't it? I, I, yeah, 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 completely. And in fact, her husband said, towards the end, when she was quite weak, her voice was at its loudest. She did more helping then. Just really? She died, yeah, oh, wow. which is, so she's left a real, you know, it's really yeah. inspirational. But one of the things about her is that it was the touching way that she prepared her son, Freddie. Mm -hmm. um, he, she didn't have very much time to talk with him and he's three years old, so it didn't take too much on and she was just saying sorry to him. But what she did, which was lovely, was she's wrapped up presents for him from his, for his, for, for him from four years old to 21 years old. Oh, so every year, yeah, yeah. a card and a present. And she's left detailed instructions with um, her, her husband's sister. Just small things about what she, instructions about school and what she wants for him, even mm. down to his haircut if, if he wants that. And little personal effects, per, her perfume, so she, he remembers her smell. It's just okay. really, really thoughtful and also a, a nice memoir called For Freddy, which talks about stories and helpful tips. Okay. And so there's all these yeah, lovely yeah, things yeah. that, she, that he'll, he's got from her, which is oh. lovely, but really sad, because um, it's quite quick, her yeah, battle, yeah. I think. Um, moving on, I've spoken about Rio Ferdinand before yes, at length, yeah. um, but just really more of an update on him and his family, because they're actually in a very good place, which is, which is great to see and hear. Um, obviously, he had to tell his three children about his ex-wife dying, and it was quite. Mm. It was the second battle of cancer, and it, and it happened quite quickly, and it was quite tra traumatic. But we, there was actually a, a TV program showing it all and showing how he yeah. handled it yeah. and the children, which was good. But the, the lovely thing now is that he's with Kate Wright. Mm -hmm. I mean, he loves her, and the children absolutely adore her. You know, so much so that they'll run past him and cuddle her. Oh. And they've got a really good setup at home where there's yeah. a special room dedicated to Rebecca, his ex-wife and their mother mm -hmm. um, and also Rio's mum who sadly passed away last last year of cancer so it's a place where they go and they talk about mummy and um, grandma okay. and just look at photographs and, and join in so that's a special place yeah. which is which is great um, I think quite an inspirational girl Claire Winfield Winefield she's got cystic fibrosis but she was told she wouldn't live past the age of 10 but mm -hmm. she, her, her parents were very honest with her she'd grown up in hospital but she's just got such a fantastic outlook on life. She's a real go-getter. Yeah. She's 20 now, and she does inspirational speaking about t to people with illnesses, saying, you know, don't let it define you, and how she has so much fun, and mm -hmm. it's so positive. So it, it, the outlook is, is great, so really good. fabulous. Um, an interesting one, I think, as well, um, a little girl called Juliana Snow. She had a neuromuscular disease which was slowly taking over her life and her parents actually gave her a choice at four years old which was to go back to hospital for treatment which would prolong her life or to come home, relax with the parents and family and then go to heaven. And so it really did give it, to, you know, explained everything. Yeah, Such yeah. an old head on her and she said she wanted to come home. Yeah, but her. I mean, they're... It was all to do with their faith. Mm -hmm. um, really, the child and the family held them together. And, and her last few weeks, well, I think a little longer than that, she, she, she was at home for, she was like a five-year-old princess. You know, they did their room up, family around, you know, love and everything. So it was just a comfortable way for her mm -hmm. to go, which oh, I think is really so quite sweet. special, yeah. which is really, really nice. Um, and I will end on, which I find quite interesting, um, as a study which suggests that Disney and Pixar films can actually help start conversations about mortality with children. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously children grieve differently to, to, to adults. And it's so, so important not to leave things too late in a child's life so that you don't want a poor end of life experience for a child. Yeah. And the, the main characters in Disney and Pixar animated more films are twice as more likely to die. It sounds a bit morbid, but it's not. Okay. Than in than in dramas aimed at adults. So it's a good way of you know talking about death yes, yeah. and, and getting it out there and even overcoming you know life issues and fears and things. 
and just it just it's like a natural development for children because mm -hmm. you can yes. imagine if you don't and all of a sudden someone dies oh, it's you know terrible mental health yeah, yeah, and everything it just it's, it's like true. a, a rolling everyone needs preparation really absolutely so um that's thank my you news. helena thank and you we'll see you again next time thank you Michelle. Well, everyone, don't go away because after the break, we have on child abuse prevention expert Marilyn Hawes to talk about yet another subject that few dare to address. Today is over-sexualized behaviors in children. What does it mean? Why does it happen? Where does it come from? And how do you deal with it? If you will think about people that actually are in this state with these problems like mental health issues, they most like close, they do not want to talk about it, most of the time they don't want to even hang out with people, um, anxiety, all of that. And this project is something very, very social that actually helps you a lot with this issue. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B show everybody. So now we have on our resident expert who deals with child abuse prevention and that's Marilyn Hawes. Hi Marilyn, Hello. nice to have you back. My, my pleasure. So we're going to discuss another uh, subject that isn't nice to talk about but we do have to do and this is exactly what you're all about is like yeah. addressing those very difficult subjects to talk about but that need to be addressed because not many people are actually addressing them, right, right. Marilyn? <laughs> We're going to be talking about over-sexualized behaviors in children. So can you first of all explain what that is exactly? Well, it can be anything on the continuum, from mm. children playing with themselves in front of you in the living room, mm -hmm. from very young preschool age, right up to the other end, where you've got very aggressive, coercive, uh, bullish sexualized behavior mm -hmm. that is there all the time isn't being contained so where are all these things coming from there's a raft yeah. of reasons why but as i say anything from a child that may not have boundaries mm -hmm. right up to something where you're looking at something far more sinister to where that could really then end up going right okay then and how how would you deal with it then what, what do you do about well that? you've got if you've preschool children funnily enough about 65 percent of those children are little girls. A mm -hmm. lot of it can be self-soothing. So yes, masturbation, mm -hmm. self-soothing, but then you've got to look out why. So if you are a mum and a dad, rather than go, ah, <laughs> what is my child doing? Mm -hmm. You know, firstly, have you got boundaries? Have you actually spoken to the children gently and then monitor it? and see is that overlapping back into the living room again? Is it being acted out on other children that are gonna come for tea or something like mm. that? Monitor it and see. Now, for self-soothing, there's very often another reason there may be other behavioral issues mm -hmm. uh, that are causing that stress. Children have got a very small repertoire of coping skills, so that is, you know, masturbating and playing with themselves is soothing mm -hmm. for a young child. Um, but there could be, and it is understood, that a high proportion, maybe from 50 to 80 percent, if that can't be contained, if it isn't just a case of boundaries and speaking gently to the child and then we're back on target again, if it is more than that, then there is absolute evidence that shows, is it to do with nudity in the home, with domestic mm. abuse going on, with other social issues in the family. So that trauma, if you like, is creating that self-soothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, what if it's something, it is something then more sinister, what can you do at that point? I, I, you have to monitor it. I yeah. think you absolutely have to monitor it. Where is this, when is it happening? How often is it happening? How have you dealt with it? Now, foster parents, overly sexualized behaviors, it's the most primary reason why a foster parent will ask for a child to be removed to another home. Now that's going to cause another set of issues running mm -hmm. because that's going to create another load of behavioral problems and also then attachment disorders because if you're going to be bounced around from foster carer to foster carer, where are your roots? How are you grounding mm -hmm. down? How are you attaching yourself to a family if you're always moved on? 
But then if it's that bad, you have to be looking at sexual abuse. Yeah. It's, it's very prevalent. Mm -hmm. You know, it is understood that overly sexualized behaviors do mostly show that the child has actually experienced it or they have watched it. Yeah. So have they seen pornography by accident? What is going on? There are other issues. But a brokenness in the family setup can be an absolute cause. And, and then, of course, you have the issue of, and I feel desperately sad for, for people that have children on the spectrum. So if you have autistic children, Asperger's children, children that have any of these um, a disability, disenabled, you know, they are three times more likely to have suffered abuse mm. by abusers anyway, three times more vulnerable. But if you're on the spectrum, children in that, on that raft are just not aware of other people's emotions, of how other people feel. They just don't know how to interpret it. So I feel for these children in today's age where we are so much more in tune with sex and what could be offensive and offending behaviour. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want for some of these children who do not understand about boundaries and limits, that their behaviour, whilst it is overly sexualised maybe and completely antisocial, you don't want someone who doesn't understand to mm -hmm. then label them as, ha ha, they're a sex offender. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that has to be looked at, that if you've got children like that, that you have to find a way of managing that and, you know, what is it going to, because those children do not understand the emotions of other mm -hmm. people and how other people read them. Um, and that's why they are so vulnerable. Do you think that'll be like maybe some special kind of training that needs to be I think developed? It's, I or... think parents have got that. I do honestly think that parents that have children in that bandwidth do need some extra tuition and help. How do you help those children? And absolutely don't react. I think the, the last thing you need to do is go, you know, running for the hills. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, oh my gosh, what's that? It might be something very simple that you can actually look at, but it certainly does need to be looked at mm -hmm. and it does need to be remedied in some way and as I say a, a school not everything is child's play I, I heard um, a, a, a school the other day well it was a parent that rang me and the neighbor's little boy was doing something with his finger to her little boy on a daily basis in the school playground hidden behind sheds you know mm. and that was written off as child's play there was what? no way that was child's play and, and I rang the school and I said, the mother is concerned. This is inappropriate uh -huh. sexualized behavior. Yeah. This is peer on peer abuse. It's also very important as well that these children are mentored, managed, mm -hmm. that you're not going to slap a sex offender label on them. Yeah. You know, children under 12 may well have had experiences of a sexualized nature that was mm -hmm. not appropriate for their age group. But don't say, Absolutely, you can't be saying, oh, they're going to end up a paedophile. Mm. You know, they may, but they may not. But, you know, when you're looking at peer and peer on abuse, peer and peer on peer abuse, which is now, thank God, now coming to the keeping children safe in education, mm -hmm. um, I would say to schools and to parents, where could this happen? Where in a school could be your dodgy, out of sight areas? Do you monitor them? Do you ask the pupils, you know, yeah, so where, where that may be happening? Do you ask pupils in that physical health and sexual education lessons, are they engaging properly in an appropriate way with a sex education? Mm -hmm. Actually, are you writing into that program um, the impact of harm? I don't think they're necessarily malicious, these children. I think it's opportunist, mm -hmm. and because I can, and yeah. I'm going to have power over you. But do they really understand the impact going forward of that peer-on-peer -peer abuse, how the person who has been chosen might still be in 25 years time. Yeah. We have to have these gritty discussions and we cannot be spineless, mm -hmm. says she, because I am so sick of people not stepping up to the line. I, I just <laughs> wanted to ask someone just very quickly before we finish, um, for a parent that, you know, that has happened to their child, this peer on peer abuse, what, what can they do? What's the best course of action apart from speaking to... Well, obviously you have to go to the head teacher, yeah. but I personally would tell the police because okay. it, especially if you're over 12, 
If you're mm. now into puberty, you're an adolescent, that could well become something far more serious. And, okay. and it, it most likely will be outside of elsewhere as well. And okay. you've got some really defined behaviour going on there. Okay. But you have to keep pushing on at the school and you have to say, you know what is appropriate and you know where the line is over which yeah, is yeah. not appropriate mm. and you just have to keep pushing. Phone us. Yeah. I'll tell you. Okay, brilliant. Marley, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Pleasure, we'll see you thank again you. Next time. Well, everyone, now it's time to go to my final thoughts of the day. I'd like to thank all my guests that we've had on today's programme, our resident experts that we have on Usually, and also to our Real Life Story guest, Donya Youssef. And I'm sure that we're going to be hearing a lot more from her and we will be, of course, inviting her back on the show to give us some updates. But what I'd like to home in on um, for my final thought of the day is the communication with your kids as well, because it, obviously you should have open communication with your children, even if there isn't anything wrong. Because if you can imagine, maybe you don't talk that much or have that many conversations with your kids. And now all of a sudden when there's something negative or something uh, difficult going on, that's when you decide that you need to sit down and have a you know, a proper conversation with your children. It's best to have that already established, um, even if nothing's going on, because your children need to be used to speaking to you. And we have mentioned before that it's so important for parents to make time for their children. I know there's work, I know there's so many responsibilities, but it comes with being a parent. You do need to sit down and, and spend time with your kids and have these conversations. And I remember growing up, um, my, my parents used to talk all the time with myself and my sister. We used to sit around the dinner table, we used to talk about how school was, we used to have conversations. Any time, even though my, my parents worked six days a week um, and long hours, it wasn't just like they used to finish at five o'clock. They, they worked from home, they, worked, they used to make clothes. They'd start very early in the morning, like half seven in the morning, and sometimes they were working up until eight, nine o'clock at night. So any, but any time they had the opportunity, they would, they would have conversations with, with myself and my sister. So sometimes I'd accompany my dad when he used to go and, and get the materials that he needed to make the garments. And he would take me with him in the car and use the opportunity just to talk to me. And um, I would say kind of prepare me for the future, talk about you know, my studies and things that plans for my future. So I always had those, those conversations with my parents and they were always very open about what was going on you know, at home with the finances, everything. So it, that was all very good for me. So again, so what I'd like to actually just, just highlight today is the importance of communication in general so that if there does come a point where you do need to share something difficult with your kids, they already are used to having those conversations with you and they're more likely to, to open up about how they feel and it's going to be a lot, lot easier to deal with everything that's going on. Well everyone, we have reached the end of today's programme but if you have a story like Donya did to share on our programme, please do get in touch with us. You can email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet or Instagram us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know more about my mental health journey, just visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Till next time, bye for now.